Hello and welcome to the Gaggle Boba Challenge, and if necessary, destroy media narratives. I'm George Samueli. With me today, of course, is co-founder of the Gaggle, Peter Lavelle. So, Peter, um, our um, friend, um, John Mearsheimer, uh, the eminent political scientist and eminent uh, practitioner, I guess, of the realist uh, school of foreign policy, has just published a very long article on his uh, Substack uh page um, outlining what he has already outlined before, which is that he doesn't think that this war in Ukraine will come to any conclusion anytime soon, and uh, that, uh, as, as he puts it, uh, the best that we can hope for is a, a frozen conflict, and the worst is a um, nuclear uh, war. Um, he presents a number of arguments, of so the very uh, very interesting arguments, and uh, thought we could uh, go over some of the points that uh, he made. Um, and um, here, you you re you really need a really tall cup of coffee to get through this one. <laughs> it was a very long, but he's a good writer, and it's yep. not. Uh, it was never uh, boring. So here he he. Um, uh, he, he says here that I will address two main questions. First, is a meaningful peace agreement possible? My answer is no. W uh, we are now in a war where both sides, Ukraine and the West on one side and Russia on the other, see each other as an existential threat that must be defeated. The best possible outcome is a frozen conflict that could easily turn back into a hot war. The worst possible outcome is a nuclear war, which is unlikely but cannot be uh, ruled out. Um, it's interesting he, just as we move forward, and I'd like everyone to keep in mind. I think it's a fabulous article. George and I have covered most of the terrain in this article. This is an amazing summation. Um, but my only quibble in, in it towards the end, and maybe at the end, I, I think that he could be a little bit more exact about what a frozen conflict is. That was the only issue I had. No, I, I, I quite agree with you because. If one thinks about what a frozen conflict, that means it's an ongoing thing. You know, in other words, it just never ends, and and that may be where we're heading. I mean, that's that's a, that's a possibility. Possible. Um, Possible. Uh, but it's it's not something like. I mean, yeah, you're right. I mean, if you say a frozen conflict, as in Korea, um, yeah, there was no no peace treaty signed, but basically there's been peace um, for seventy years. Uh, or you could have a frozen conflict, which means that it's just ongoing and could start up all over again at any moment. And then he says here, uh, second, which side is likely to win the war? Um, and then he says Russia will ultimately win the war, although it will not decisively defeat Ukraine. In other words, it is not going to conquer all of Ukraine, which is necessary to achieve three of Moscow's goals, overthrowing the regime, demilitarizing the country and securing and severing uh, Kiev's uh, security ties with the West. But it will end up annexing a large swath of uh, Ukrainian territory while turning Ukraine into a dysfunctional rump state. So that that's kind of his prognosis. I mean, when he, he goes through. Um, all, all, yeah, but, all, all but he, I, I think I, I think that, you know, again, he, he trips up over it's not going to conquer all of Ukraine. But in the article, he's just saying it's not necessary. So. Uh, no, I don't think it does. No, he, but I think that, you know, it, it, to the extent, and this is what we've talked about uh, in the past, I mean, if that rump Ukraine survives and it just becomes this um, NATO-run entity, rabidly hostile, uh, determined to continue the war uh, with Russia, then again, that's, uh, that's still going to become a problem for Russia uh, in, in years to come. Um, and then, then, so he says... This is Russia's threat environment. It has been clear since April 2008. The Russian leaders view the West's efforts to bring Ukraine into NATO and make it a Western bulwark on Russia's borders as an existential threat. Indeed, President Putin and his lieutenants repeatedly made this point in the months before the Russian invasion, when it was becoming clear to them that Ukraine was almost a de facto member of NATO. And then since the war began... The West has added another layer to that existential threat by adopting a new set of goals that Russian leaders cannot help but view as extremely threatening. The West is determined to defeat Russia and knock it out of the ranks of the great powers, if not cause regime change or even trigger Russia 
to break apart like the Soviet Union did in 1991. What, what I thought was also interesting about this article is that Mearsheimer pretty much accepts Russia's view of what happened. I mean, he, the, you know, it's not he doesn't do any kind of symmetry. Oh, how the West sees Russia. He doesn't he, he takes none of that seriously. He, but he does take what Russia uh, says uh, seriously. And, and you know, you can pretty much you know go all the way back to Zbigniew Brzezinski and on all the plans of the 90s. Yeah, there was a clear Western plan to take Ukraine away from Russia's orbit because, they, as Brzezinski explained, Russia without Ukraine is really kind of an insignificant power. And and that and that's been a plan. It's a long. It's been a long term plan since 1991. Well, you're, you're absolutely right, and that's what makes this article um, very instructive. Because um, I, I I encourage our viewers to read it. There's nothing about re, uh, the nature of the regime, about democracy, all this. Stuff. He doesn't care about that. Okay, that's what realism is. He doesn't. It's not a morality play for him. He's not interested in it. No. And it's not important in geopolitics. That's why, it, it, number one, he's a very good writer. It's very crisp. I really no. liked it. Um, but it, it's refreshing also is that you don't get all of the Western rules-based order verbiage, right. you know, um, for human rights brigade, all this. Right, it, right. For him, it's immaterial. Yeah, that's exactly um, In a major address Putin delivered this past February, he stressed that the West is a mortal threat to Russia. He further emphasized that the Western elite make no secret of their goal, which is, I quote, Russia's strategic defeat. What does this mean to us? This means they plan to finish us once and for all. Putin went on to say this represents an existential threat to our country. And again, Mir could have could have said, yeah, and I've got I've got the receipts. I've got all of the statements made by uh, Western, in particular, American leaders that bear this out. I mean, that's what they, you know, that so, so this is not Russian paranoia. This is statements from key um, American uh, political figures. Um, and uh, and and you know, there's that you know that Rand Corporation study from 2019 extending Russia. That's 2019. Um, you know, the, the Russians read that. So, uh, um, so Russia must win this war, given that it believes that it is facing a threat to its survival. But what does victory look like? The ideal outcome before the war began in February 2022 was to turn Ukraine into a neutral state and settle the civil war in the Donbass that pitted the Ukrainian government against ethnic Russians and Russian speakers who wanted greater autonomy, if not independence for the region. It appears that those goals were still realistic during the first month of the war and were in fact the basis of the negotiations in Istanbul. And then, but a deal that satisfies Russia's goals is no longer in the cards. Ukraine and NATO are joined at the hip for the foreseeable future, and neither is willing to accept Ukra Ukrainian neutrality. Uh, furthermore, the regime in Kiev is anathema to Russian leaders who want it gone. They not only talk about denazifying Ukraine, but also demilitarizing it, two goals that would presumably call for conquering all of Ukraine and compelling its military forces to surrender and installing a friendly regime in Kiev. Um, well, well I I, I, no. I, I'm not convinced of that last part there, but and that's uh, uh, an ongoing difference that you and I have had. I think that you can have, you know, half of Kiev, whole of Kiev, and, and the Russians with their fate complete saying, you will remain demilitarized. Any military equipment that comes into the country, we will destroy, okay? I, th that is a, a, a possibility as well. Now, of course, that doesn't take into account how NATO would feel about it. So right. I still think that that's a little hazy, but nonetheless. Right. Um, a decisive victory of that sort is not likely to happen for a variety of reasons. The Russian army is not large enough for such a task, which would prob probably require at least 2 million men. Moreover, the West would go to enormous lengths to prevent Russia from overrunning all of Ukraine. Finally, the Russians would end up occupying huge amounts of territory that is heavily populated with ethnic Ukrainians who loathe the Russians and would fiercely resist the occupation. I mean, the thing is also, and here he again, um, Mirsheimer doesn't get into it, but... Um, 
uh, this has been a long-term project by the West, you know, pitting Ukrainians um, against Russians. And it's it's been a very cynical policy. But for the West, it's actually been quite successful. I mean, after all, yep. this is a, it's a terrible war and Russians and Ukrainians are dying by the tens of thousands. I mean, it's, it's hey, two Slavic nations are slaughtering one another. Nice for Victoria us. Newland, you know, we, we have a good Victoria, time. Yeah. Victoria Newland is very proud of herself. That's right. Um um, rhetoric about denazifying and demilitarizing Ukraine aside, Russia's concrete goals involve conquering and annexing a large portion of Ukrainian territory while simultaneously turning Ukraine into a dysfunctional rump state. As such, uh, Ukraine's ability to wage war against Russia would be greatly reduced and it would be unlikely uh, to qualify for membership in either the EU or NATO. I think this is something that Mearsheimer has said in a number of these public lectures, is that, that's, that that's kind of what Russia's objective now is, just simply uh, a, a steady um, destruction or, you know, you know the, the de decapitation or whatever of the, um, of the Ukrainian state. Um, and, so and it would also be a, a huge um, drain of um, EU resources, okay, right. to come right. to... to maintain this uh, dysfunctional rump state. And that would, right. I think that's part of uh, the Kremlin's calculations as well. Right, right. Um, what would that dysfunctional rump state look like? Moscow has officially annexed Crimea and four other Ukrainian oblasts, which together represent about 23% of Ukraine's total territory before the crisis broke out in February 2014. Russian leaders have emphasized that they have no intention of surrendering that territory, some of which Russia does not yet control. In fact, there is reason to think that Russia will annex additional Ukrainian territory if it has the military capability to do so at a reasonable cost. Russia is likely to attempt to annex the four oblasts, Dnipropetrovsk, Kharkiv, Mykolaiv, and Odessa that are immediately to the west of the four oblasts it has already annexed. If that were to happen, Russia would control approximately 43% of Ukraine's uh, pre-2014 uh, territory. So that, you know, it's it's uh, a, a kind of, you know, a, a brutal war. <laughs> yeah, um, but that's that's 43% the Bolsheviks gave the Ukraine gave Ukraine. <laughs> yes. It's a, but again it's it, it's an interesting one because he and Mirsheim is, uh, suggests, and, and, and that, you know, we don't know what the Kremlin's plans were in February uh, of last year, what they were thinking. But it seems to me that when they made their charge towards Kiev, that they were hoping to somehow uh, get some kind of an agreement with uh, right. Ukraine, shock, shock them into uh, sitting down and working something out. And then I think quite generous terms might have been an offer, much too generous in my view. But I think the Russians would have offered very generous terms. Uh, if I, I think you, you, you're spot on in your reading. This is exactly how I feel. The Western interpretation that, you know, the Ukrainians scared the Russians off and all of no. that. No, no. Boris Johnson showed up and said, the West is not going to back you. you got to continue. And the Russian right. says, OK, plan B. Let's move away from yeah. uh, Kiev. And now we go to plan B. That's how I read it. I think we're right. Yeah, I think so, too. Um, NATO expansion before 2014 was not justified in terms of containing a dangerous Russia. In fact, it was Russian weakness that allowed the West to shove the first two tranches of NATO expansion in 1999 and 2004 down Moscow's throat and then allowed the George W. Bush administration to think in 2008 that Russia could be forced to accept Georgia and Ukraine joining the alliance. But that assumption proved wrong, and when the Ukraine crisis broke out in 2014, the West suddenly began portraying Russia as a dangerous foe that had to be contained, if not weakened. That's a very, that's very, very astute. I mean, in a way, it's obvious, but it's very, you know, he, he puts it very clearly. Yeah, no one was thinking in the at that time in the 90s uh, and and the, the beginning of the century that that oh, we have to have NATO expansion because Russia is so strong and and powerful and dangerous. Hey, Russia is so weak. Basically, we we can just ram it down uh, Russia's throats. Um, and that, that, that's kind of what Bill Clinton and George W. Bush yeah, were both thinking. A, a great power masquerading. Uh, no, a, what is it? Um, a gas station. Um, masquerading uh, is a, yeah, gas masquerading station. Masquerading is a great power. Great power yeah. Yeah. 
that's right. That's right. And then now they've kind of changed the thing. Oh, we, we must have Sweden and Finland uh, in, in NATO because it, it, Russia is so terribly scary. Um, so, um, And then the United States and its NATO allies have made clear their unequivocal commitment to winning the war and maintaining Ukraine's sovereignty. Uh, thus, losing the war would have hugely negative consequences for Washington and for NATO. America's reputation for competence and reliability would be badly damaged, which would affect how its allies, as well as its adversaries, especially China, deal with the United States. Furthermore, virtually yeah, but, every... If, yeah, if I could just interject here. Mm -hmm. This is an important paragraph because this was a craven choice on the part of the West. They, did, they didn't They did have to go down this path. They made that this was a conscious decision on their part. Right. They put themselves into this position. They, right. they put themselves, be, because of the way they have framed the conflict, they see it as existential, but that was a choice on their part. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and uh, because they decided, they decided that they would just simply shove Russia out of Europe altogether surround uh, Russia by uh, hostile NATO states, and then Russia would just simply be insignificant and irrelevant. Uh, and then they and they continued with that policy. They, they stuck with that policy despite despite the obvious failure of, of that policy, the obvious failure of what, of what they were doing in Ukraine. They continued uh, down this path and just simply are not give, giving up. And so now, you know, as absolutely right, as you know, as you point out, a Mearsheimer points out, you know, now, now you've, you, you, you've made this an existential one for yourself, even though it shouldn't be. No one's threatening you. You know, no, no, no one's putting uh, military bases uh, on America's border. No one's put, put, putting military bases on France's and Germany's borders. You made this. You, you uh, made this an existential matter for yourself. Yes, and keep in mind, everyone, see how asymmetrical it is. Russia is not saying there has to be regime change in, in Washington or not in London. Right. They don't care. OK, right. um, but Washington and London and Brussels want regime change in Russia. That's a asymmetrical. It's asymmetrical. No, that, absolutely. Um, furthermore, virtually every European country in NATO believes that the alliance is an irreplaceable security umbrella, thus the possibility that NATO might be badly damaged, maybe even wrecked, if Russia wins in Ukraine, is cause for profound concern among its members. Well, I don't know. I mean, I think it's more among their members' elites. You know, that's the kind of babble yeah. they, they, they talk about uh, over there, lavishly uh, whining and dining uh, in their meetings. Um, I don't think, you know... Orban sits there thinking, well, I'm really worried about Russia. You know, Russia might invade us. I mean, you know, any, any serious politician would say, look, there's absolutely no chance whatsoever of uh, Russia's invading us. Yeah, that's right. It gives up the game here. I mean, I thought it was a defensive alliance. Right. Okay. So, yeah. no. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. I mean, what what kind of <laughs> defensive? He, I mean, Mearsheimer himself says there's nothing defensive about any of this. So you know, the, the, so but you know, yeah, the, all these politicians, these hacks who are on, on the NATO payroll, yeah, yeah, you know, of course they, you know, you, you know it, it, it's it hits them in the pocketbook if there's no NATO, no na no NATO, no jobs. What are we going to do? Uh, oh my God, <laughs> the grift could come to an end. <laughs> exactly, um, and then as should be clear. The West is staunchly committed to defeating Russia. Specifically, the, the aim is to defeat Russia's army in Ukraine, erasing its territorial gains and cripple its economy with lethal sanctions. If successful, Russia would be knocked out of the ranks of the great powers, weakening it to the point where it could not threaten to invade Ukraine again. Western leaders have additional goals, which include regime change in Moscow, putting Putin on trial as a war criminal, and possibly breaking up Russia into smaller states. Now, notice Russia doesn't have any comparable such mm. goals for the United States. It's not like, well, what we want to do is we want to break the United States up. You know, we're going to back the red states against the blue states. Um, we want, um, uh, you know, basically Scotland to break away from the UK. No, at no time does Russia put forward any such plan, but the Western powers all the time are putting forward these kinds of plans. And Russia put forward its plan on December 17th, 2022. 21. Uh, 21, excuse me. They, they Basically, what they want is 
um, uh, a new security architecture in Europe, the uh, indivisibility of security, and roll back NATO hardware up to its borders for the um, to to back to 1997. Yeah. Okay, certainly NATO is going to uh, object. The U.S. isn't going to like it, but that's. That was the point of negotiation. Let's sit right. down and let's, let's massage these things, right. okay? Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Do not take it seriously. Oh, NATO's no, doors are always open and all this. <laughs> That's right. But That's I mean, right. what George, what, you know, I'm, I'm emphatic and I'm going to stick with my position that that is going to be what the Russians are going to work for toward is the, the two things that is said, the two core things that they wanted, okay? Now, events on the ground have changed a lot. When you lose a lot of soldiers and you've been uh, demonized by the Western world, your appetite is probably going to increase. But it, I still think it's going it, to it'll revolve around those two poles. Well, I, I think that's yeah. I, I, I yeah. I, I know that's that's what I think Russia will do. I, I just don't think that um, the West is going to 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 negotiate anything. That's why I, I do tend to think that some kind of a frozen conflict does seem a mo most likely outcome. In other words, just simple. Kind of exhaustion, but no agreement, no no negotiations, no no, no nothing. I mean, it's just basically uh, we'll freeze it here, and then we'll kick the can down the road for you know see what happens in the next ten years. I just so that it's just not it, like it, the it, it, it's, it, not, it's not like the Americans. They're not they're not just going to give up on this. No, no, too big a but project. It, it, but it, it doesn't bode well for whatever is re uh, rest uh, what is ever left of Ukraine. No, no, I, that I agree with. Yeah. Um, uh, turning to events on the battlefield, the war has evolved into a war of attrition where each side is principally concerned with bleeding the other side white, causing it to surrender. Of course, both sides are also concerned with capturing territory, but that goal is of secondary importance to wearing down the other side. The Ukrainians are at a disadvantage in these encounters because the Russians have a significant firepower advantage. Um, but I have to say, I mean, a war of attrition is a particularly brutal kind of war. I mean, it's not like, you know, the kind of, even, even the war that the, the Wehrmacht waged, I mean, the war, the Wehrmacht waged a very classic kind of war, which is you seize the uh, commanding heights of a country and force it to surrender. So, but boom, hey, you can't conduct the war anymore. You're done. You sign, sign a surrender. But attrition, just how many, how many uh, people die on both sides until, you know, one just gives up, say, we, we're just running out of manpower. I mean, that's it's just, it's just quite horrific. And there, there are very strong indications, even mentioned in Western media, that um, the Kiev regime is beginning to panic. It's it's in a uh, with its um, um, hauling off of young men off of buses and streets and cafes and whatnot. In some uh, parts of the country, eighteen to sixty is it the you know the, uh, can be just nice. um, uh, uh, in, uh, impressed into the military. So um, oh, they, it, they, it, they, yeah. they have manpower issues. No, I have no no question. I have manpower issues, and and keep in mind that when you when you haul people off buses, um, you don't have time to train them. So if you send them to the front, I mean, death is almost a certainty. I mean, if you haven't been, you haven't even got the minimal military training, chances are you're going to survive for all of about twenty four hours. So um, so it's 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 quite horrific. Well, and these people know it. I mean, yeah. you know the. the... They, they have cell phones. They're, they're they're contacting their friends and family right. and telling them what's going on. Right, right. Um, what is the basis of my claim that the Russians are likely to win the war? The Ukraine war is a war of attrition which, in which capturing and holding territories of secondary importance. The aim in attrition warfare is to wear down the other side's forces to the point where it either quits the fight or is so weakened that it can no longer defend contested territory. Who wins an attrition war is largely a function of three factors, the balance of resolve between the two sides, the population balance between them, and the casualty exchange rates. And it says the Russians have an advantage in population size and the marked advantage in the casualty exchange rate. The two sides are evenly matched in terms of resolve. And then it says Russia has approximately five to one advantage in population size. Um, that's because there's so many Ukrainians have left the country, so that gives them that. Um... Which never gives any. Well, first of all, you know, it's very little coverage, and there's very little coverage of the uh, the U 
Ukrainian citizens who are ethnic Russians that have come to to the Russian Federation. Very little, you know, it's everybody that goes to Poland and Hungary and and whatnot, but it's very little covered. A lot of people have come um, right. uh, from from the Donbass and from other regions. Right. Um, Ukrainian forces have surely suffered much greater casualties than their Russian opponents for one reason. Russia has much more artillery than Ukraine. By almost every account, the Russians have somewhere between a 5 to 1 and a 10 to 1 advantage in artillery, which puts the Ukrainian army at a significant disadvantage on the battlefield. Thus, a casualty exchange rate on the order of 2 to 1 in Russia's favor is a conservative uh, estimate. So that's uh, that's his uh, estimate. Um and then he says, there's a growing chorus of voices around the world calling for all sides in the Ukrainian war to embrace diplomacy and negotiate a lasting peace agreement. This is not going to happen, however. There are too many formidable obstacles to ending the war anytime soon, much less fashioning a deal that produces a durable peace. Um, the best possible outcome is a frozen conflict where both sides continue looking for opportunities to weaken the other side and where there's an ever-present danger of renewed fighting um and then um here pretty, this, pretty glum very pretty very glum. glum and then and then here this is a kind of an interesting he's his kind of conclusion which i think is you know he's almost angry here he says a few words are are in order about how the west ended up in this dreadful situation and then he says the conventional wisdom about the war's origin is that putin launched an unprovoked attack on the 24th of february which was motivated by his grand plan to create a greater Russia. As I have said on numerous occasions, there is no evidence to support this line of argument. And it, indeed, there is considerable evidence that directly contradicts it. The ultimate cause of the war was the West's decision to make Ukraine a Western bulwark on Russia's border, which we've said, I don't know how many times here at the, at the gaggle on crosstalk and, and so on, that the ultimate cause of the war. So he actually said that that's the cause of the war. Wasn't 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 Putin? The war, it was the West that uh, was the cause of the war, um, and that's quite strong for him because, as you said, you know he's a realist. You know, said, "Hey, I'm not getting into the morality of anything. I'm just getting into you know what, what how each side sees things." But here he's kind of pretty much saying, "Yeah, you know, had it not been for this this ridiculous plan to bring Ukraine into NATO, there would have been no such war." Well, um, it, it, all the more so, all the more so, George, is that. He be, being a realist that he is, he he goes he. Mearsheimer is a, a really um, a scenario guy. He he goes through different scenarios, and there's one part. There's an element of almost every single scenario that terrifies him and ter should terrify all of us. Nuclear war, and that's why I think we we see. The, the, a tiny tiny bit of emotion come out of this right. guy because he doesn't like to show emotion. Right. Right. So um, it says the key element in that strategy was bringing Ukraine into NATO, a move that not only Putin, but the entire Russian foreign policy establishment saw and as, as an existential threat that had to be eliminated. And um, the opponents of NATO expansion were correct, but they lost the fight and NATO marched eastward, which eventually provoked the Russians to launch a preventive war. Had the United States and its allies not moved to bring Ukraine into NATO in April 2008, or had they been willing to accommodate Moscow's security concerns after the Ukraine crisis broke out in February 2014, there probably would be no war in Ukraine today, and the borders would look like they did uh, when it gained uh, independence in 1991. The West made a colossal blunder, which it and many others are not done paying for. Um, you know, and all, all the more so, George, is that, you know, it, it's something that, you know, you and I have mentioned so many times is that the Istanbul process, Zelensky was essentially being asked by the Russians to give up something that he no longer had. He yes. no longer had Crimea. He no longer had Donbass. He was asked to give up something he no, he didn't have. That, you know, and, and, and of course, the neutrality issue there. But, you know, Given what we've seen, that is a damn good deal. It was a very good deal. And, it, and if we can believe Lukashenko, and I don't think Lukashenko is lying, Lukashenko was suggesting that Russia was offering 
some kind of a financial package for Ukraine for Crimea. I mean, he said it's something like leasing leasing it out to, to Russia, but that just sounds like they were working out some, some compensation. All right, you've lost Crimea, we're going to pay you a whacking great sum, maybe a regular payment um, annually for-, for but, uh, but, but they were already doing that in a way. They were already leasing it. So basically we're going to declare sovereignty over it, but we'll- Pay the lease, okay. Uh, yeah, that, this is politics, okay. It's right, no, no, this, but at least you would have got something. And again, maybe you know, for the Donbass and everything, they would have paid Ukraine something. So you would have, you, you would, yeah, you, you know, you would have given up on this territory, but you would have got some sort of um, compensation, um, and uh, and there would there would have been no war. Um, I mean, I, you know, the, the, you know, the Russians have been extraordinarily uh, patient. I mean, as, as we've said before, I think in 2014, I, I, I think that Russia had an opportunity then to move in, knock out this um, illegitimate, illegal coup regime. They could have had international law on their side. They said that basically, hey, they, they, these people were a threat to our people. They, they came to power illegally uh, by violence. Uh, they're a threat. We're just going in to knock them out. Yeah, that have been sanctions, that have been screaming and shouting. Well, but yeah, they would have had international law on their side. At least, you know, at least they could have made that argument. And they could have easily made the argument that the EU reneged on a deal that exactly. it negotiated. Exactly, okay. exactly. I, 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 you know, from um, uh, 2014 to 2022, I struggled very, very difficult with the, the proposition that Russia should have gone in. I, I believe I was wrong. I was wrong. I think it should have been done uh, right. because it avoided this. Yeah, no, I, I, I think so because uh, I think that was an opportunity. And then, and, and you could have had the the international, the all sorts of precedents. You could have had, you know, the, the president of India in 1971 when it moved into East Bengal because they said, hey, these are Bengalis, you know, we, you know, West Bengal is part of India. So we, we're worried about the fate of the Bengalis at the hands of the Pakistan government, um, uh, which was using excessive violence. The Turks did that with the Turkish Cypriots. I, I think the case of Turkey, <laughs> their case was much weaker than um than Russia's case, because the Turkish Cypriots were not under any kind of threat, and and Turkey nonetheless invaded Cyprus. So, um, uh, but Russia, Russia could have, you know, they said, yeah, legitimate threat. You know, we got fascists, Nazis, Bandera. You know, where this is, you know, we, you know, we, we're very concerned about uh, the fate of our people. Um, well, so. but the everyone, I hope George puts the link in there. It's very. Yeah, I, I already posted the uh, the 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 uh, the article. Yeah. This is it's a seminal piece. OK, I, I, I think it'd be really hard to add to it. OK, yeah. um, it, I would have maybe had a few um, um, footnotes about the political crisis of February two, uh, 2014. I, I would have put a, a little bit more right. skin on those bones. But then yeah. he's just trying to be dispassionate about right. it. OK, right. right. But um, uh, he, he gets it right. And and George pointed out. Mirsheim at the very end, you know, placing blame. That's yeah. that's not usually his style. Right. No, 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 not not at all. Because I think that um in his previous, I mean, I think that in that debate, that that awful debate with those uh, Mc, Mc, McFall and um and Sikorsky, he kind of was being very um, you know, well, you know, great powers, you know, great powers act, you know, irrationally, you know, just the Americas acted irrationally. You remember how he started it? Yeah. You, the yeah. first words. Yeah. Great powers sometimes make mistakes. That's I mean, right. Yeah. When I heard that, it's over. It's over. It's over. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. You know, you can see that. That's it. You've conceded them the argument. That's it. <laughs> so what a shock. They they lost the debate. Yeah, you 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 conceded. Yeah. Um, but here he's 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 absolutely um unequivocal. Um that this is a war that could have been uh, averted, should have been averted. There were plenty of opportunities for the West to um, avert it without losing anything. That, that was the thing. The West could have made the concession without losing anything. I mean, it was, it's like, well, we can't do it because it's we have to make such a big concession. You wouldn't have conceded anything. I mean, just simply respect Russia's uh, security. That's all. No, no, no one's asking you to sacrifice anything. Just respect Russia's security. And and look what has happened since. See, this is why <laughs> making a U-turn is impossible. Look at some of the numbers. I think it came out yesterday. The real deindustrialization of Germany. I mean, it, it it's real. Okay, 
What's I mean, how do you reverse these things? I mean, it's and then who blew up the Nord Stream pipeline? I mean, political facts have been created on the ground now that you can't undo. You can't right. undo it. Right. And and you know, particularly in the United States, I mean, they uh, acknowledging a policy is a failure. Then when does that happen, George? Right. I mean, I mean, no, no, well, maybe, no. you know, years. You know, yeah, there were mistakes, but with Iraq, and some were mistakes were made. Okay, right. Right. but that's years later. That's right. That's right. No, I mean, I think that uh, the the West made a geopolitical gamble. They said, hey, we have a historic opportunity, essentially, to push Russia out. You know, it's, it's, the, you know the, it's the old German dream, just shove Russia out of Europe altogether. They don't belong here in Europe, but let them just you know, stew in their own juice in Asia. Um, and they wouldn't give it up. It, it was a, it's a, one of these geopolitical fantasies um, for which then other people pay with their lives. I mean, it's it, it, it's total fantasy. It's it's just something you write down on paper. It doesn't have any real reality. But that's that's what that's what they have, because there was never any need to expand NATO. There was never any need to reject Russia's uh, you know, perfectly reasonable proposals. You know, there were you know Russia wasn't asking. They knew perfectly well, Russia doesn't pose any sort of threat to us. You know, it's like well, well, if we could, we we agree to some kind of a uh, an international security agreement, therefore we're we're in danger of being invaded. Russia, not nothing like that was on the table. But they couldn't do that. They couldn't make that uh, sacrifice. And even now, Stoltenberg goes on: Ukraine will be a member of NATO. That's just, that's absolutely certain. Ukraine will be a member. Okay, great. So. You, you're not after they win. Yeah, after right. they win. After they win. All right, which means it, we, we, the permanent war. You've now essentially said there's now going to be a permanent war. Europe is now going to have a permanent war on its doorstep. You, you, Europe can never enjoy peace for generations. That that's that's generations. the Stoltenberg plan. You can never yeah. have peace. And, and 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 to back up what George was saying, you know, it, it, it trying to um, assess Russia's intentions, aggressive intentions. Well, there are three little countries in it, in the north, the Baltic republics. I mean, that's a weekend job, okay? Right. I mean, right. Finland, uh, Sweden, um, they've never had any pro it, for for decades. They've had no problems with the Soviets right. slash Russians. That was what that would have been easy pickings as well, okay? okay. But they didn't happen. Yep. It, it didn't happen. That's right. That's right. That's right. There was there was there was never there were any threat. They saw their opportunity. I think and Bill Clinton. I think didn't he write something to explain why did he push for NATO expansion? He said, "Well, you know, we were worried about what Russia might do in years to come." But you know, what kind of a stupid thing is that? I mean, you know, why we, you, know, you don't you don't sit there thinking, "Well, what might happen in twenty five years?" Um, because all you're now doing is precisely. But you made it happen. Yeah, that's right. Um, it was know, a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right. Exactly. We, we exactly. expanded because we were worried Russia would get stronger. Well, you expanded and Russia got stronger. That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, that's right. Um, and 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 I think and, and, and like they will continue with this and basically continuing for a permanent uh, war. And and this is what's what is so extraordinary is how little. I mean, I guess the public just doesn't pay much attention. You know, it's one of those things. But, you know, we got this supine journalist, you know, part of the kind of the media political class that none of them ever asks their political leaders. What you're doing is essentially prescribing permanent war. You know, we had, you know, we had this, uh, all those years of peace in Europe after World War II. And now, essentially, you're, you're saying we have to get used to permanent war, permanent, you know, impoverishment uh, and a, and a which means permanent threat of nuclear destruction. I mean, you all of that. This is thanks to your your policy. You know, no, Ukraine will be a member of NATO, irrespective of the fact that it guarantees war. Can't backpedal, can you? you can't yeah. go. It's always it's always, ra <laughs> ratcheting up in one direction. I think it was the Hungarian foreign minister in the last news cycle actually. I'm almost verbatim quoted me. I mean, very you know, it's a coincidence, but you know. Europe no longer has prosperity and it does not have security. And that was always the promise of the EU. Right. Now, so it was actually it was, or, it was Orban himself who said that. Orban there's Orban there's, no, there's no, peace and no peace and no prosperity. Yeah. yeah. And then but, but with the EU, you know, kissing the ring of NATO, which you'd think it would be the other way around, but this right. is the world we live in. Okay. Yeah. So EU yeah. policy now is directed, uh, is under the direction of. Uh, uh, the other institution in Brussels, NATO headquarters, which has a direct speed dial to Washington. Yep. 
that's right, that's right. Yeah. To total subordination uh, to uh, Washington. And, and in the meantime, they're not even able to deal with any of their domestic problems. You know, you and Macron showed up at Brussels at the big EU meeting. He has to go back to Paris because, you know, the city is burning, and so you know, oh, you know, I'm just like, oh, Ukraine, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. The whole bloody city is on fire. You know, I, I was thinking about that. I was looking at some of the videos and all that. You know, and they're still gleeful about the Pogrosian clown show, but but, but Paris is burning. <laughs> <laughs> Look over there. Look over yeah, there. That's right. <laughs> Everyone, give Mirsha Amir a good read. Uh, I think it's a really good summation that with everything that's happened um, from 2008, as he probably as where he starts his chronology, all the way to the present. And and I will look forward to Mirsha Amir adding layers to it because I think it's a really good foundational document. And I'm I'm going to refer to it uh, um, uh, from time to time to see what can be added. The 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 the. The, the the wrinkle for me is what we mean by frozen conflict. And George and I have been right. chewing on that right. and we will continue to chew on it as events on, on the ground. Right. No, 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 that's right. Um, all right. I, mean, I think all he, really, all he just meant by that, uh, and again, he leaves it ambiguous, is that he doesn't think there's going to be any kind of a negotiations. I mean, you know, even though um, Stoltenberg always says, is this war will end like all wars at the negotiating table. No, it ain't going to happen. There's, there's no negotiation. So I think that, that's, that's, I think, all that uh, uh, Mearsheimer means. Uh, all right, everybody. This is The Gaggle with Peter and George. We're on local, so please go to thegaggle.locals.com, visit our store. And since today is Friday, I just... I would just wish you luck until Tuesday. <laughs> it's, it's terrible, you know, it's the summer, you know, beautiful weather outside, but basically you're crying on the inside uh, because there's no, <laughs> there's no uh, live stream till next Tuesday. However, next Tuesday is July the 4th. So it will be a wonderful day to celebrate. Uh, but, I think you should get a self-help line set up. Okay. <laughs> Maybe you want to, you want to man that line. I, I, don't know. I think so. Yes. 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 <laughs> Uh, buddy's available. <laughs> so, uh, we're very grateful for all of your help and friendship and support. Um, you know, if you have some, you know, a few bob in your pocket, whip them out. Think about little buddy. You know, he he's going to be very depressed till July the 4th. Um, so, uh, you know, we'll see if we can keep up his spirits. Um, so remember, if you like the gaggle, please like, share and subscribe. See you soon. Bye.